I'd like to bring in our second speaker, um, who's also a member of the Workshop Planning Committee, Dr. Ricardo Salvador. Dr. Salvador is Senior Scientist and Director of the Food and Environment Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists. He works with citizens, other scientists, economists, and politicians to help transition our current food system into one that grows healthy foods while employing sustainable and socially equitable practices. Earlier in his career, while he was an associate professor at Iowa State University, Dr. Salvador taught the first course in sustainable agriculture at a land grant university in the US. And he worked with students to establish Iowa State University's student operated organic farm. With other faculty at ISU, he developed the nation's first sustainable agriculture graduate program in 2000. He's been a longtime analyst and proponent of clear thinking about sustainable agricultural systems. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce him to you today. Thank you. So I'd like to begin uh, by talking to you about the disclosures that I need to be clear about. So you can see that I've been a creature of the land grant university system as Matt has just described. Uh, at the Union of Concerned Scientists, we depend primarily on the financial support of our members and supporters. We do take foundation funding, which you see listed there. We take no government funding and we take no corporate funding. I'd also like to talk to you about the advisory roles that I play. I have no direct financial conflict of interest with any of these organizations. However, since I am going to address labor issues, I do want you to note that. I personally and my team at the Union of Concerned Scientists works quite closely with labor groups. And in fact, at the very moment, we're working on some labor protection legislation that we're advocating in Congress um, that we hope is adopted this week. So with that, I'd like to elaborate on the analysis that Patrick introduced to us uh, at the beginning of this session which is this remarkable report from the National Academies that dates back to 2015. So Patrick has already given you the general overview of this report. I think it's remarkable because of the fact that it is very common for all of us to appeal to the need for systems analysis when we work in complex adaptive systems like agriculture and the food system is. It's a totally different thing to actually remember that when we do our work. It is much more common to make that appeal and then carry on with business as usual. What was particularly valuable about this report to me, uh, and which I highly commend to you, was actually in the appendix, where they worked through an actual example of what the principles that they were recommending would actually mean in the real world. And so what I'd like to do is to walk through a table, if you will indulge me, which you can find uh, in the full report, that actually illustrates what this means. And I want to go through pains to go walk through this example because of the fact that the issue that I want to bring to you, which is a very specific issue uh, where science needs to figure, uh, scientists need to take a stand, and where we have not for reasons that this table will illustrate, generally speaking. So you can see listed about the top of this table uh, that there are three different domains that the table is going to illustrate across three different dimensions of the food system. And so let's begin with the first one. First of all, I identify the quantity of different types of capital or attributes in the food system are trackable characteristics. So an example for the health domain is that in the case of food, we can track whether sufficient calories are being produced by an agri-food system. An example in the environmental domain is that while it is important for us to be productive, as Patrick mentioned, there are always trade-offs and we need to be productive, mindful that the necessary resources to be productive need to be conserved, if not actually regenerated. So land and water are a couple of examples of that. And then here's the uh, place where most of us in the uh, physical and biological sciences 
tend to fall flat, even though the work that we do is often premised on saying that we want to improve socioeconomic outcomes. And so an example here would be, obviously food is not a philanthropy and all of us who eat need to be able to cover the cost of that food. And therefore, whether there are disposable incomes adequate to cover the cost of that food is an important characteristic of the socioeconomic system. So let's go to the next uh, uh, dimension, and this is quality. And in quality under health, you can see that there are several different ways of assessing or tracking whether the agri-food system is aiding or diminishing uh, health. So one would be that workers should be able to experience safe workplaces, that we observe occupational safety guidelines. The other one would be that what we're producing is actually safe to consume, that it, we can trust that it's going to be free from contaminants. Uh, that what is being provided actually measures up to what the best science uh, in medicine and nutrition tells us that we should be eating to maintain health. In the environmental domain, you can see that the example given is that um, while uh, agriculture has been largely industrialized, it is practiced largely with biological and ecological assets. And not to manage those biological and ecological assets means that it is very easy to degrade them for keeping them out of sight and out of mind. And so we should track the biodiversity and the integrity of ecosystems in terms of in the environmental domain. And likewise, in the socioeconomic domain, it isn't um, enough to simply produce a lot of calories. We obviously, to maintain health, need a diversity of foods and they need to be available across all income levels. I want to particularly stress that part because it is very unusual when biophysical scientists make an analysis like this that they actually note that the equity component in the socioeconomic domain is important to track. So I'll repeat and I'll underscore sufficient food across income levels. So for the next category, we have for an example of health, physical access to that large variety of foods. And again, I'll underscore what the committee recommended. It isn't just physical access period. In the real world, we have to note that this is for all. Everyone should be able to afford the healthful food supply that is being referenced here. And likewise, in the environmental category, it's very important that we recognize that particularly if agrochemicals are going to be used to fertilize or to protect crops, that there are residues that consequence of the way in which those agrochemicals are managed. And it's very important that those be actually captured uh, on the farm and that they not be redistributed across the landscapes and concentrated elsewhere outside of the farm. And that's something that's eminently trackable and also something that can be addressed with management. So you can you see the pattern here. What we're building is a dashboard of things that need to be tracked simultaneously. So the um, symmetry in the socioeconomic uh, category here is very important to note. We address access to a variety of foods for all again, but this time it is the economic access. So physically, we live in a world where at present, we can feel a feed already, the 10 billion that we predict to be here by mid-century and beyond. However, not everyone on the planet now has economic access, even though food production and food sufficiency theoretically uh, is already here. And then for the last example here, of uh, the uh, dimension of resilience. This is, as you might suspect, the one that is most germane uh, to the moment in which we're in at present. And uh, this is the one that I'll uh, come back to, and this is really where I'm going to dwell for the majority of uh, my remarks. So the example for health is, for instance, that uh, if there is an instance of contamination, uh, uh, say an E. coli contamination uh, in vegetables, um, that the trust that we have in the supply chain is such that we know that within a few days that food system, that supply chain will recover from that. That would be an example of resilience. In terms of environmental resilience, one very germane concept at the moment, uh, as Dr. Rosenzweig described, we are in a scenario of climate change already and under climate change, we can all expect more frequent and more violent uh, uh, precipitation. And so an example of resilience would be that the amount of time to recover 
active production after drought or flood uh, should be something that is minimized. And then uh, where I'm largely going to focus and what I've been driving at here and what is very unusual for a report by uh, biophysical scientists to underline is that there needs to be community well-being factored into the concept of resilience. And the example that they provided in this particular table is prescient uh, to the pandemic and very germane. And it's essentially the example that I'll be a little bit more verbose about by saying, imagine that the food system is engineered as if it were a Jenga tower. How many pieces can you take out before the thing collapses? And of course, a system as critical as the food system ought to be designed and managed as a very robust system, a very resilient system, where the loss of a single major employer does not threaten the economic viability of an entire community, which is in fact the scenario that we're seeing in meatpacking plants throughout the country at the very moment, and we're not seeing the other side of it yet. So um, I ask for your indulgence as I walk through this table. It conceptually is very easy to take a glance at and understand, but it is so um, germane to the moment that we live in. And I'll underscore, it is a very different proposition to advocate for managing agri-food systems this way than it is to act on them. And the moment calls for us to act on what this National Academy's report recommended five years ago. So the specific example that I wanna dwell on to illustrate that uh, has to do with the dynamic nature of the system. And I'm gonna draw again from an illustration in this report. So uh, here we're taking a look at a satellite image of a confinement hog production facility in the state of North Carolina. And uh, what we're gonna see is the concept that the uh, uh, report uh, uses to talk about the dynamic nature of the food system. Here you see just very quickly a, a fairly uh, conventional linear description of the way in which we combine uh, inputs with farming knowledge and management, we generate output, and then that is distributed to consumption. What I want to actually note is that the study committee noted that there's at least two systems that are involved and that require management here, and they affect one another. It isn't just a linear process. So there are the natural resources, and then there are the human systems. Now, a measure of resilience, of course, uh, has to do with how quickly the system recovers after it has been challenged. So imagine the insult to this particular scenario that we've seen here that is represented to the original state by a catastrophic flood, which is in fact exactly what happened in uh, the transformed state. So in the transformed state, going back to the prior table, there are very specific things that you can measure. measure. You can measure the resulting quality of air. Uh, you can measure what has happened to the biota. You can measure what has happened to land, in this case, probably uh, most likely erosion and uh, the quality of water. It is very likely to be very contaminated uh, with fecal uh, material. Uh, now, it's very important to note that those are the outcomes, not just of the natural event, but of human decisions about the production model that is being utilized. And those are decisions that can be changed based on what is learned about the frequency and the likelihood of events like this. And on the social side, in the human system side, here are uh, four examples that the study committee recommended. So um, health, so as a result of insults like this, what is going to be the outcome in terms of the possibility to thrive as human beings? Uh, do the systems that are illustrated in an example uh, like this illustrate the economist dream of buyers and sellers discovering uh, what the most efficient production systems and what the best prices are for the things that we exchange among one another? Very relevant to that, are there fair rules for everyone? Particularly if public resources are gonna be utilized, then our public policies, which are essentially the authority to direct public resources to a specific end, consistent with the public interest? And are they reinforced? And lastly, the thing that I want to underscore about this very simple illustration is that we're very subjective participants in these systems. All of us have a very deep interest in our own well-being, and to the extent that we're public actors in the government, say, or at publicly funded institutions like land-grant universities, we make a claim that our work is designed to contribute to the public well-being. And that is often something that, again, is very easy to say, and we usually don't really pay attention to it in our metrics uh, when we perform our science, when we issue our reports. 
So I want to give you a very specific example of that and particularly end with how that uh, could change and how it must change, that this is a lesson of the present pandemic. The example I want to draw on is the example that has been in headlines uh, dating all the way back to the beginning of the pandemic, which is the specific case of meatpacking workers. So I want to give you a snapshot of who these folks are. And so let's proceed very quickly with just a few, few simple numbers. So first of all, even though there are many more people employed in that sector, the number of workers who specifically are in slaughter lines and in uh, you know, the reverse of what you see in an auto assembly plant, the disassembly workers, is uh, nearly 70,000. Let's just use uh, round figures. 46% um, of those workers have known infections. This is an extremely high rate. In other words, if you're working in meatpacking, one out of two of you, essentially, has caught this disease. Now, it's very important to know a principle uh, that everybody who works in the food value chain cites, and that is that the further you go into the back of the house, the browner it gets. It's a very important demographic feature of our system that in a nation that is two-thirds white, nearly two-thirds of the people that work in meatpacking are people of color. And we could make analogous cases for what it's like to work in the fields and in the back of the house in restaurants. But we're working with this specific example, so I'll just continue to talk about the demographic features of this particular group. Now, of the deaths that have occurred around uh, within meatpacking uh, workers, predominantly they've occurred among the people of color who work in meatpacking. And the important thing to note about these folks is that they have also an economic profile. Um, they do all that they do for an average annual wage of about $28,620. And to get a feel for this, you should compare that to what the poverty level is for a family of four in the continental United States, which is $26,200. Now, I hope that gives you a picture of the folks that we're talking about because we need to talk about how that uh, matrix that we just saw from the study uh, committee applies to the situation like this. And the stances that scientists uh, need to take uh, in dire socioeconomic conditions like this. What I've described to you is an outcome of a series of uh, concatenated or uh, cascading uh, decisions about our model for the food system. Um, here's the very, very direct and very blunt thing I want to say about the role of science. There are among these nearly 70,000 workers that I mentioned to you actually on the line slaughtering and disassembling carcasses, 168 known and confirmed deaths of COVID-19. Now, it needs to be said, this is a vast underestimate. If we actually took those statistics at face value, it would show that in meatpacking workers, both the um, uh, case mortality rate and the absolute mortality rate are lower than they would be for the population at large, uh, which uh, actually cannot be. The reason for this is that the data, our knowledge about this, are distorted by active data suppression because we live currently in an environment where the highest authority, the highest public authority in the land actually promotes obscurantism and the denial of science and the denial of information on the premise that what we don't know can't hurt us. So here's a place where scientists need to take a stand because it is affecting public well-being and is related to decisions that we are making or are failing to make within the food system, very deliberate decisions. Now, having established that point, that that number is a vast underestimate of the reality, the next thing to talk about is that those are tragic deaths because they are completely preventable deaths in the literal sense that we know what to do in order to prevent them occurring. So you see here a CDC publication that actually outlines the very concrete recommendations to meatpacking plants, specifically poultry uh, processing facilities. And we don't need to go into them in detail because most of these you would actually predict, uh, you know, so they're about social distancing, they're about having protective equipment, they're about establishing shields, and so on. Now, the key thing about this is that even though we know exactly what to do, this is not occurring. And the reason is that even though these guidelines come from solid science, and uh, uh, you can find them on the official websites of CDC and OSHA, 
these are voluntary guidelines. The industry is not obligated to adopt these uh, recommendations. Now, uh, Patrick mentioned in his introduction that a few weeks ago, the Board on Agriculture and Natural Resources of the National Academies uh, hosted a webinar and that one of those speakers was the former Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack. And what he said about this situation was that this is a case where the industry clearly needs to shift. The reason is that they over-engineered their plants for a very specific production scenario, which is now shown to be a failing scenario for a pandemic uh, environment. And that they need to retool their plants so that first of all, they're not as concentrated. They need to have more plants of smaller scale where they actually plan for greater social distancing and don't find themselves in the situation right now where it's a great cost to them and therefore they resist all the retooling that they need to do in existing infrastructure. Those are just the pragmatic facts of the situation and something that uh, uh, Secretary Vilsack directly addressed. Now, uh, as you all are aware, these are workers that do not have a choice about showing up to work. We, society, compel them to show up to work. They're afraid to show up to work because they might get sick and die. They're afraid not to show up to work because you've seen their income level. They are in the most precarious layer of society. So they're obligated to work. They're not provided in most of the instances, the protections that you and I would expect if we were working under hazardous circumstances. And so their situation is an exploitative situation. And this is how that situation was actually wrought upon them. Uh, you all are familiar, uh, I'm sure that the Department of Homeland Security defines the uh, cybersecurity infrastructure of the nation. And as such, they have this nice grid of essential critical infrastructure workers. You see food and agriculture figures there. I think all of you will remember uh, this uh, moment uh, when uh, one of the uh, largest meat packing meat processor plants in the nation took out full page ads uh, in order to make the case that they needed to have workers compelled to show up to work because of their own, they were uh, increasingly absentee because of the fears that I mentioned to you and that this was affecting the productivity of plants. And of course, the uh, company, I'll come back to this in just a little bit, argued that it was their responsibility to keep the nation in protein. And therefore, this was the reason that workers needed to, compelled, to be compelled to show up to, to work. Now, this happened on a uh, weekend. I'll give you the specific date in just a little bit. But I want you to contrast that with the following table. I've already walked through the fact that there are existing guidelines that would have prevented at least 168 deaths among meatpacking workers, and we do not observe those because, by and large, meatpacking workers do not have the political power to compel the government to look after their safety and occupational well-being. But contrast that with this table. Here you see the value of a company that even though it has lost about a third of its market value during the pandemic, still has a market capitalization of about $18 billion. You'll notice what happened to their market value. These are their share values immediately upon the beginning of the pandemic. You notice the trough, the crisis that they experienced in March. And that particular executive order that they wanted was something that they obtained on 28 April. Let me just be very specific about this. On the weekend of 26 April, a Sunday, they ran their full page ads in the New York Times and the Washington Post. Two days later, a president who has been recalcitrant and reticent to use the Defense Production Act, used the Defense Production Act to justify calling these workers to work, compelling them to show up at plants. That is political power of the sort that workers do not have. Furthermore, what you see here is an illustration of something that we've actually embedded in business models. The justification here is that, of course, the company, and let's take the best read, needs to actually look out for the interest of its shareholders. What they specifically asked for was not only for workers to continue to show up for, but actually what they were concerned about was their exposure to liability because they were compelling people to come to work in hazardous situations. They wanted protection from that. Because otherwise, what you're looking at here, uh, you know, refer to the table from the study group, is a living example of a business model that failed you know, by the brutal rules of the market under pandemic situations. Uh, so I wanted to illustrate this to you as an example of asymmetries in political power and outcomes that are directly connected to decisions that we can make or not make in the food system. 
and in which science is actually complicit because of the fact that we lend our authority, our engineering, our knowledge to a particular business model that ultimately ends up exploiting people, making them vulnerable, exposing them to mortality. Now, there is a reason why we're in the midst of a uh, large-scale uh, turmoil in this nation. I want to point out to you, and we should not ignore that in addition to the pandemic, in addition to a crisis in democracy, in addition to an anti-science administration, another crisis that we're facing is that as a result of the murder of George Floyd, 59% of white voters in this country now agree that there is systematic discrimination against African Americans in this nation because they saw a very vivid example of how some lives are expendable. Well, I'm putting it to you that in the food system, we have another sector of the economy where lives are expendable. And I've shown you just one example of those lives and how exactly they are expendable and the decisions that we're, we make in order to sanction that. Now, I repeat, this is one example. We could go throughout the entire value chain and grab other examples that would be uh, just as vivid as the one that we've walked through. So having gone through this and justifying why it is that science groups such as ours need to first of all recognize the data, apply the framework recommended by the National Academy studies, and then take action and advocate for policies that are consistent with what those recommendations uh, tell us around balancing socioeconomic outcomes with the rest of our biophysical knowledge, we want to go back to that table. And I want to specifically talk about that intersection that intersection that talks about community viability and community well-being. I want to ask us all as scientists, and I know that there are also folks from business and there are also uh, folks uh, from other pursuits here, but I'm speaking specifically to my fellow scientists here and appealing to the fact that we need to discontinue the practice of making lofty appeals to systems thinking in order to better serve social outcomes and actually begin to act on those, meaning that there needs to be better balance on the intersection of this socioeconomic domain and the dimension of resilience. If we've learned anything from the pandemic, that is the ultimate lesson that I wish to bring to all of our attention and consideration. Thank you, Matt.